This is CARE 11 News at 10. Thanks for joining us. Frank is off tonight. Jeffrey May is still in critical condition tonight at a Fargo hospital. He suffered a stroke and his left side is paralyzed, but doctors don't know if that's permanent. His family, though, calls him a hero. They say he is able to communicate through notes telling them what happened inside Red Lake High School Monday. Through his notes, May told his family that he tried to stab Jeffrey Wiest, the gunman, with a pencil when Wiest came at him with a gun. He said he tried to help a couple other students and the way I understood it was he, he tried to stop, you know, prevent a couple females from getting shot and he tried to wrestle around there a little bit. And we shot May in the right cheek. The bullet lodged in his neck. Doctors say he's breathing on his own but is being kept heavily sedated. Jeffrey May is one of two shooting victims still in critical condition at a Fargo hospital. Both he and 15-year-old Stephen Cobanez were shot in the face at close range. Cobanez lost his left eye, and doctors say he also suffered severe brain damage. The three victims in a Bemidji hospital are all in fair condition and improving. They are 14-year-old Ryan Auganash and 15-year-olds Lance Crow and Cody Thunder. Tonight we are learning more about the 16-year-old teenager accused of killing nine people before killing himself. Carol Evans' John Croman is live in Red Lake tonight with more on Jeffrey Weiss. John? Well, more on Jeffrey Weiss in a minute, but what you just mentioned, uh, we can upgrade that. The three young men recovering here at North Country have now been upgraded to good condition. In fact, one of them is feeling good enough to actually plan a news conference for tomorrow morning, which we'll be bringing to you. But uh, as far as this community recovering, that is going to be a long road, and it's only just beginning. Day three on Red Lake, disbelief gave way to grief. It's hard. It's hard. Victoria Brunn wanted the world to know how much her brother, slain security guard Derek Brunn, will be missed. Derek was a kind, generous, big-hearted man, and he gave to this community. He was a positive as asset to this community. 37 miles south in Bemidji, the Red Lake flag flew at half-mast outside City Hall, and at the city's hospital, young voices filled in some of the blanks. He was just my friend. He was cool. I didn't really believe him he was going to do that. Seventh graders Michelle Kingbird and Tashina Benes spoke of a computer chat room conversation with Jeffrey Wees, the 16-year-old mass killer, in which he threatened to attack the Red Lake High School on April 20th. On 420, he said he was going to shoot up the high school, but we didn't believe him. Why 420? Because it was Hitler's birthday, yeah. and it was his hero. And while Michelle's stepbrother, Ryan Aganash, is among those recovering from a bullet wound, she holds no anger against the attacker. He was my friend, but he killed some of my friends too, so I don't know. Across town at St. Philip's Catholic, a prayer service for Red Lake's victims. Father Bob Stone regretted that evil is alive and well in a world where children's lives are being taken by other children. My friends, our children are killing our children. Among those in the church, Audrey Thayer, a white earth civil rights advocate, here to help her Red Lake friends and their children. You love your children. You love them, you love them, you love them. And I have never seen um, a nation like Red Lake that wouldn't give 150 plus for any child. Red Lake native Robert Cook performed a Native American blessing with burning sage and an eagle's feather. He says he's not a healer, just a helper. And in the Ojibwe tongue, we're told there's no word for goodbye just until later. And that, and that there's loosely it's translated as? Um, well, be good to see you again. Okay. Be good to see you again is what he said. Now, we're told of some of these funeral services that are being planned, and there are a lot of them, as you know, coming up. Some of them will be traditional ceremonies in which friends and families gather together, help these people for this four-day journey the spirits will take to the next world. Now, speaking of this world, there's more coming to light about the Internet ramblings of the accused uh, of the killer, uh, Jeffrey Weiss, but we have not yet known or been able to determine whether those can really be traced to him or there are people trying to post things on the Internet, on the internet pretending to be Jeffrey Weiss. Back to you. All right. All Thanks, right. John. Today, Jeff Weiss's stepfather, Timothy Desjardins, remembered the boy as a good, quiet kid who liked to draw and watch movies. Desjardins divorced Jeff's mother in 1999 and hadn't seen Jeff in more than five years. He says he did try to reach him several times, but the two never connected. I mean, this is all in hindsight, but I wish I knew what he was going through now, that he was a loner and stuff like that. And, you know, I wish I had 
I wish I knew about that. I wish I could have talked to him. More positive. People across the country are looking for ways to help the Red Lake community deal with its grief. Tonight, members of the local Native American community held a prayer vigil in Minneapolis to honor the shooting victims. Carol Evans' Boyd Hooper is live in Minneapolis with that story. Boyd? Rick, about 50 people gathered tonight at the Minneapolis Indian Fellowship for what proved to be an emotional and spiritual service. We The Ojibwe choir sang and members of the congregation prayed for the victims and survivors of Monday's shooting. It is quite common for Red Lake Indians to share time between Minneapolis and the reservation, meaning many ties between the two communities. Especially for Red Lake band members who maybe grew up up there and spent most of their life up there and are now living down here in, in the Twin Cities. Uh, they know people, they have relatives, they're connected to the community. Uh, their hearts are still up there, and, and they're grieving just as much as probably a lot of the uh, community members that are actually up there. Indeed, members of the congregation spoke tonight about ways that they might help people on the reservation. Some of them are planning to volunteer their time and cars to drive uh, relatives and friends of the victims to the funerals uh, in the upcoming days. Others talked about putting together some sort of a dinner in the weeks to come where they would actually take food and, and drive up to the reservation to put together a dinner for people on the reservation. Rick yeah, and Julie? It's good to see so many people turning out. They all want to help. Thanks, Boyd. Mm -hmm. Well, for some people in Colorado, the shootings at Red Lake are bringing back memories of the Columbine High School massacre. In the 1999 Columbine shootings, Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris killed 12 students, a teacher, and themselves. Columbine's principal says he is trying to reach school officials in Red Lake to offer his condolences. He also says he may call in counselors to help students at Columbine when they return from spring break. Well, today we learn more about those killed in the Red Lake shootings. And as Carol Evans, Amy Hockard reports, each was special in his or her own way. He is the young man at the center of the firestorm. 16-year-old Jeff Weiss took his own life after taking the lives of nine innocent people. Described as a loner, he often talked about death and zombies. Tragically, no one was listening. Weiss's grandfather, 58-year-old Daryl Lushier, better known as Dash, was a lifelong tribal police officer. He had a reputation for focusing on the positive. One of his favorite songs was, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Lushier is survived by four children, two under the age of 10. 28-year-old Derek Brunn proudly guarded his alma mater, Red Lake High School. He was a former police officer training to become an EMT. A few years ago, he lost his four-year-old daughter to a medical condition. His family finds comfort knowing they are now together. At just 14 years old, Alicia White, who also went by Alicia Spike, helped her ailing grandmother take care of her six younger siblings. Friends describe her as sweet and selfless. Alicia died alongside her good friend, 15-year-old Thurlene Stilday. Thurlene's family fondly remembers her love of singing, dancing, and telling stories. One of five children, her friends describe her as popular and always happy. 62-year-old Neva Rogers was an English teacher. Her family believes what set her apart was her ability to connect with students who needed not just a teacher, but a friend. 15-year-old Chanel Rosebear was tall and graceful. She made the most of her height by playing basketball and found an outlet for her sunny demeanor on the cheerleading squad. 15-year-old Dwayne Lewis also played basketball, never letting his lack of height discourage him. A point guard for his ninth grade team, Lewis was known as a natural leader who made friends easily and kept them close. 15-year-old Chase Lucher will be remembered by some as a hero. There are reports he was shot after pushing a classmate out of the way. Lucher had a lot to live for, including a newborn son. Also killed in the shootings, 32-year-old Michelle Sagana. She was the companion of the gunman's grandfather, Daryl Lucher. They were together more than 10 years and had a son named Devin. The Red Lake Band of Chippewa has set up a fund to help families of the victims. If you want to help, you can drop off monetary donations at any Wells Fargo location or send them to the address on your screen. We'll be right back. Being diagnosed with prostate cancer may be difficult, but you're not alone. Hi, I'm Arnold Palmer. 
If you've been treated for prostate cancer and your PSA levels are rising, Red Lake Indian Reservation today, parents thanked teachers and told stories about the violence that students saw. In just 10 minutes, Monday afternoon, a student gunman named Jeff Weiss had beaten the security, murdering a school guard, a teacher, and five classmates. Then he killed himself. In tonight's team coverage, Bridget Bornstein shares two survivors' stories. But let's start with Nelson Garcia and new insights about the shooter himself. Nelson? Don, I talked with the people who knew him best, the people who lived with him. The family of Jeffrey Weiss says they had no idea he was ready to snap. They knew he had a troubled childhood. But in the end, his family thinks being bullied by other students pushed him over the edge. And it really hurts to hear the media portray him as something that he wasn't. Tammy Lucier says her nephew Jeffrey Weiss was not the violence-obsessed monster people think he is. He was a lot of fun to be around. He liked to joke around with the family and with his friends. But after his father's suicide eight years ago... It was really hard for him. He was close with his father. His family says Jeffrey started having emotional problems, which he kept bottled up inside him. A lot of his feelings came out in his writing and on his drawings. He was a very good artist. And he was teaching himself to play guitar because he found comfort in music. It was therapeutic for him. His Aunt Shauna says he often sought advice from his grandfather, Daryl Lucier, one of the first people he murdered, Tammy and Shauna's dad. He was very close to his grandfather. For him to hurt his grandfather is... We'll always ask why. I could never be angry at him because I know he didn't mean what he did. They accept they may never really know why he shot up his school on the day he was supposed to be celebrating his cousin's 10th birthday. My heart goes out to the families of all the victims. Weiss was close to all of his cousins like they were his brothers and sisters. His aunts say the morning of the shooting, they had a meal with him, they had lunch with him. He seemed fine. Don, they thought it was going to be just another normal day. All right, Nelson, thank you. Coming up at 10.15, Darcy Pollan takes a closer look at the violent stories and online rants apparently written by Weiss himself. Amid all of the pain, we're hearing new stories of heroism tonight. A security guard named Derek Brunn and a teacher named Neva Rogers both died in the attack. Brunn didn't have a gun on him when Weiss made him the first victim at the school. Another guard working with Brunn says he ignored her pleas and ran to confront Weiss. She says that bought her and a group of students time to escape. Other survivors told Brunn's relatives that his dying act was to keep Weiss from entering a classroom. He gave his life to save others. And he was unarmed. He couldn't protect himself. Brun's family says he was training to be an EMT. They say he loved the students he guarded. Five students died in that attack. Their principal said, quote, The death of a child is a death out of season. It ages us all. Chanel Rosebear and Thurlene Stilday were both 15 years of age. Alicia White, sometimes called Alicia Spike, was just 14. Dwayne Lewis and Chase Lucher also died in the shootings. Those boys were 15. Tonight, Lewis's mom has one plea. So his dad can find him? So his dad knows what's going on? Because I can't find him? She stopped to talk to the news media and showed us her son's picture, hoping Dwayne's dad will see it. 
the family has been unable to reach him to tell him the tragic news. Well, right now, two students who suffered terrible wounds are getting treatment at a hospital in Fargo. 15-year-old Stephen Cobanez, uh, he was shot in the head. His family says he is getting better, but boy, he's got a long way to go. 15-year-old Jeffrey May is also critically hurt. He wrestled with the shooter and was shot at close range. May's family met with reporters this afternoon. His mom says he can communicate by writing notes, and he's been asking what happened. Asking about all his friends, and he asked about his, t he said, did he kill my favorite teacher? And I had to tell him everything, you know, because I didn't want to hold it back from him and let him hear later. Ryan Oganash, Lance Crow, and Cody Thunder are also getting stronger at a hospital in Bemidji. Today, their families and doctors shared encouraging news with us about their progress. And as Bridget Bornstein explains, relatives think the boys' faith and fast thinking helped them survive the worst. In a matter of seconds, Ryan Oganosh was convinced his time had run out. He was shot and fading fast. He said I felt like I was going to die. I was going away, and then I could come back. So he summoned the little bit of strength that remained after taking a bullet to the chest, and he prayed. Ryan's family says he believes that prayer in what he thought were his last moments helped save his life. And though he is in a lot of pain, his family says he's being strong through this physical and emotional struggle. The victims are not just in hospital beds. They are also the witnesses who are scarred by what they heard and saw. Though classmates told her to run because gunfire could be heard, Ryan's sister Michelle couldn't move. She was stunned to hear her brother was among the wounded. I just stood there and I started crying because I heard about my brother that got shot. Now, a couple days later, a welcome bit of good news. Ryan Oganosh is well enough to be moved out of ICU. It's a good day today for us that he's, he's getting better. And um, I just, we're just praying for a speedy recovery. Also recovering from a chest wound, Lance Crow. He loves to play basketball and used his defense skills to protect himself. Lance's doctor says he was shot in the hand when he held it up to block the gunfire. And even after he took the bullet to the chest, his uncle says he used some strategy. He didn't move for hope that would convince the gunman not to shoot again. I think what saved him is he told us he played dead. And tomorrow morning, we expect to hear from two of the shooting victims here at the hospital. They want to tell their stories in their own words. And Don, they're expected to do just that at a news conference scheduled for tomorrow morning here at the hospital. All right, Bridget, thank you. If you'd like to help the families affected by the school shootings, you can make a donation to the Red Lake Band of Chippewa Memorial Fund at any Wells Fargo bank. And we've posted that information on WCCO.com. Online, you'll also find an interactive poll. Here's the question. What would have helped prevent school shootings? So far, most voters say nothing can stop someone who is determined to kill. Tonight, the sex accusations against one Winter Carnival Vulcan could lead to big changes for them all. Tom Trudeau served as the Vulcan King. Last month, three bartenders said he sexually touched them during a ritual involving a garter. Trudeau denied that. Now a task force set up to review Vulcan... He may have seemed like a loner to some classmates, but Jeff Weiss was looking for a place to fit in, looking online. He appears to have wanted to be a part of something and to have someone connect back with the, these messages in a bottle that he's sending out on the Internet. Weiss appears to be all over the Internet. On a Nazi website, he's native Nazi. And here's a bizarre photo he appeared to have doctored for an online profile. A friend says Weiss was obsessed with horror-themed music and websites dedicated to it. But most disturbing and revealing, online journal entries and short stories, which seem to be written by Weiss. Uh, this was a person who was looking for connections, looking for reinforcement. Assistant Professor John Logie teaches university students about the Internet. If were I a parent, I would be really concerned. Weiss sounds hopeless in this entry. I'm living every man's nightmare. I must really be worthless. This was a tormented adolescent. Dr. Paul Reitman is a forensic psychologist. 
It's his job to evaluate the mental health of criminals. I showed Dr. Reitman the material we believe Jeff Weiss posted online. There are suicidal themes, there's homicidal themes. <clears throat> this is very indicative of a young man who's deeply disturbed. The chilling story surviving the dead starts in a school during a shooting. The sound of a blood-curdling scream echoed through the hallways. He had heard plenty of screams in his 16 years of life, but never anything like that. It was a cry, a death cry. In a sense, it was a cry for help, but no one heard it. Reitman believes Weiss's internet use is just one of several red flags. The others, his family background, peer isolation, and the music. Listen to one of Weiss's favorite artists. Explosive lyrics, especially for a confused kid. With his mindset, this was just a lot more matches being thrown on gasoline. So many red flags that nobody saw. Professor Logie and Dr. Reitman agree. The internet seemed to give Jeff Weiss a sense of belonging. Unfortunately, they say, he was connected with people who shared and encouraged his antisocial views. We have some programming changes we'd like to share with you. Tomorrow night, it is tourney time again on Channel 4, and you can watch the NCAA basketball game starting at 6 o'clock, and then they'll be followed by our late news sometime after 11. And, of course, the big uh, basketball tournament snowstorm is poised to, well, probably give, just give us some flurries. It's actually looking even less than that. Really? Just got to look at the latest guidance. Good news for commuters. I think it's going to stay south, so no need to worry. I hope about tomorrow's weather.